Welcome to Southwest on behalf of our evangelism committee and the church. We, we welcome you here, both online and present. To begin, we'd like to start by singing Psalter 223. Psalter 223, all three verses. All three, 223. Let's open in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we come before thee in the evening hour this day. We thank thee, Lord, for bringing us together as a people, thy people, and thy house. We pray that thou will instruct us in this evening, that we may know the past, but also the present. And as we consider even the abuse that lies around, lies around us in this wicked world, may we not be unwise to that thinking that that abuse is not in the church also. For sin abounds, thy people are sinful, and for that, O Lord, we pray for forgiveness. We pray that thou wilt open our ears and our hearts to receive this word. Help us to apply it to our lives. Help us to know our weaknesses. And we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be with the speaker tonight. To that end, be with Prof. Greece as he brings to us this instruction also and give him what he stands in need of, and in wisdom and in truth. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt forgive our sins and cause us to look for Christ's return. In his name alone we pray. Amen. I'm going to read the passage that Prof. Greece has chosen for tonight. Second Chronicles 19. Second Chronicles 19, we're going to start at verse 5. Nineteen verse five. And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. 
Moreover, in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priest and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities, between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and judgments, ye shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord. And so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren, and this do, and ye shall not trespass. And behold, Amariah the chief priest is over you in all matters of the Lord, and Zebediah the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah. For all the king's matters, also the Levites shall be officers before you. Deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with the good. By way of introduction, Prof. Grease grew up in Colorado, you probably know that, and graduated with a BA from the University of Northern Colorado. He's married to Lael with seven covenant children. Southwest First Church, or Southwest Church first got to know him when we were involved in domestic missions in Pittsburgh. And him and his wife, and I believe at the time two young children, twins, 2008, came and helped out for six to eight weeks. So there's a little bit of past there, and we thank him for that there as well. He graduated from the seminary in 2009, was ordained that same year in October, and he had pastorates in Calvary, Hall, Iowa, 2009 to 2018, first PRC, Grand Rapids, 2018 to 2021, and then he was appointed to the seminary in 2021 also as professor of practical theology, theology and New Testament studies. So I introduce his speech tonight, Sexual Abuse in Calvinist Geneva, Prof. Grease. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you too to those who are <clears throat> participating online. Appreciate that you're willing to come out or to log on for this speech here tonight. Thank you too to Southwest PRC, to the Evangelism Committee, especially for the invitation to speak to you. Though the topic is somewhat heavy, it is a necessary topic and I thank you for inviting me to speak. The speech tonight is a combination of two purposes. The first is to address, <clears throat> although uh, briefly and in limited ways, the stomach-churning, painful, and apart from the grace of God, <clears throat> for those who have experienced it, utterly soul-crushing reality of sexual abuse. This is something that <clears throat> we are learning more about, and rightly so, and things that we need to learn more about are still out there to be sure, but I intend to address that topic tonight. Whenever we endeavor to learn more about a particular issue, it is good for us to turn ourselves a number of directions. The first direction is up, to Jehovah God in prayer, beseeching God who alone is wise to grant us wisdom in dealing something that we don't have with something that we don't have a firm grasp upon yet. God, give us wisdom. James tells us that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally. Please, O oh God, give us wisdom. 
So we turn up first. And then having turned up to Jehovah God in prayer, it's wise to turn down to the scriptures lying open on the table in front of us and the creeds right under that that are faithful interpretations of the scripture that we might put them upon our eyes as lenses through which we might view all things, including this thing. Wisdom from God is chiefly found in the scriptures. Let's put those scriptures upon our eyes and understand them and say, oh God, show us what we need to see also through the lenses of sacred scripture. And then, having done that, it's wise for us to turn to the right and to the left and to look around us and hear from people, especially who have experienced this tragic thing perpetrated upon them in their life for wisdom and understanding. Still with the lenses of Scripture upon our eyes, even our experience must be viewed through the lenses of Scripture, but asking questions, and what do we need to know? Then it's wise also to look ahead of us, in front of us, to see if there are those <clears throat> who have dealt with this issue in the past and who are farther along the road than us in the dealing with it, still with the lenses of Scripture upon our eyes, but looking up ahead and looking for help from those who have more experience than us with this, perhaps. And then finally, it's wise to also turn around and to look behind us and to ask the questions of the past. How was this dealt with in the past? Still with the lenses of Scripture upon our eyes through which we view all things, because of course the past is not infallible either, nonetheless, often the wisest of the multitude of counselors is back there behind us. And there's wisdom from them with this situation too. There truly is nothing new under the sun. They dealt with this in the past. And it's wisdom for us to turn around and to ask them how they handled it and to learn some valuable lessons from them. So that's the first purpose of the speech tonight. The second purpose of the speech tonight is also to celebrate the great work of God in the 16th century Reformation of his church. Reformation Day is Monday, and this is a Reformation Day speech. One of the vital aspects of that Reformation was the restoration of spiritual discipline to the authority of the church. And God used especially John Calvin for that restoration of spiritual discipline to the authority of the church. At a time when even aspects of the now growing Reformation movement were content to give at least part of spiritual discipline over to the civil magistrates, if they were Christian civil magistrates, Calvin said, absolutely not. The church must conduct her own discipline and must conduct her own discipline all the way. This is the responsibility. This spiritual discipline is the responsibility of the church and not the state in any degree. And by God's grace, through God's use of John Calvin, the church in Geneva became a marvelous example of what it looks like when this discipline is conducted faithfully by the church. Our understanding of the offices of the church, of the calling of elders, of church discipline, is derived in part from Calvin's Geneva. What Calvin himself set forth doctrinally and then what was set forth by example in Geneva. And though there's development from there, and though there's a long history from there to today, of course, that stream has its fountain fundamentally in Geneva. The effect of that restoration of faithful church discipline 
to the church herself in Geneva became a thing of wonder to many. Perhaps you know that John Knox famously said that Geneva was the most perfect school of Christ that had been on the face of the earth since the time of the apostles. Add to that a Lutheran minister who visited Geneva and said, When I was in Geneva, I observed something great that I shall remember and desire as long as I live. All cursing and swearing, gambling, luxury, strife, hatred, fraud, etc. are forbidden, while greater sins are hardly heard of. What a glorious ornament of the Christian religion is such a purity of morals. Friends praised God for what they saw in Geneva. Enemies decried it, though they recognized that it was marvelous, they attributed it to the work of the devil in trying to deceive people to leave the Roman Catholic Church and come to the Reformed faith. But none could deny it, the effect of the Word of God and faithful church discipline in that city. And yet, there were sins in Geneva. And now, to combine those two purposes together tonight, there were even these terrible sins in Geneva that the consistory, having had discipline restored to it, had to deal with. Sins of sexual abuse. The consistory in Geneva always had a clerk, just as our consistories have a clerk. And their clerk took down the minutes of the meetings of the consistory of Geneva. Only in the last few decades have those minutes become more accessible to us. There's 27 volumes of them just from the time of Calvin in Geneva. Most of them are in French, yet some in English. But from these minutes, we know much about the work of the consistory in Geneva, including their work with cases of sexual abuse. So I'd like to begin this evening by briefly explaining to you how the consistory of Geneva did its work. And then I would like to even more briefly point out the kinds of cases and the amount of cases that the consistory had to deal with. And then finally, let's learn 10 things from the consistory's handling of these particular cases of sexual abuse. Geneva is right here, just to the east of France. Switzerland was not formed yet. This is the outline of what Switzerland would be. But the city is here. Most of the people of the city spoke French. It was a city of 10,000 people when Calvin got there, although the city grew and eventually doubled in size to be a city of 20,000 people. Most of the additional 10,000 were French refugees who were reformed and who were leaving the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church in France. The city itself is right here in black on the eastern shore of Lake Geneva or Lac Le Mans. The Rhone River comes out of Lake Geneva and flows to the east, so it cuts Geneva uh, into two. These other shaded portions are territories that Geneva controlled at the time of Calvin. This is a drawing of the city from a little bit after the time of Calvin, although basically it would have looked the same at the time of Calvin. There were four main churches inside the city walls. St. Pierre right here is the largest church, or St. Peter's. This is where Calvin preached every Lord's Day. Madeline, St. Germain, and St. Gervais. The ministers rotated pulpits during the week, so Calvin preached in the other churches during the week, but on the Lord's Day, he was here in St. Peter's. Besides these four churches, there were 11, in the 40s at least, churches out in the rural areas. And at any time during Calvin's stay in Geneva, there were between nine 
and 23 ministers serving the churches in Geneva. Here's St. Pierre or St. Peter's. Madeline is behind there. St. Germain and St. Gervais. Here's a few pictures of St. Peter's. They called them temples, churches. Inside of the main church that Calvin preached in. I don't think this pulpit is original, but it's similar to the one Calvin preached from. And this chair is original, is the actual chair that Calvin used and studied in. Calvin formed the consistory. The consistory, according to the word of God, ruled over the spiritual life of God's people, shepherded the flock in Geneva. That consistory contained all the ministers who were in Geneva at the time, so between 9 and 23 uh, depending on how many were there at the time. And it included 12 elders, and that was always the same. 12 elders and between 9 and 23 pastors. Somewhere between 25 and 30 or so people sat on the consistory of Geneva. The consistory met every Thursday at noon and conducted the business of the spiritual oversight of the church. So they had weekly meetings, and if they didn't finish, then they met the next day. Calvin himself, in spite of everything else that he had to do, attended almost every meeting of the consistory. He was a faithful pastor and was involved in the pastoral work that the consistory had to deal with. Calvin, however, had to fight for his consistory for the biblical understanding of the consistory and its right to oversee the discipline of the lives of the members. Perhaps you recall that Calvin was in Geneva for a couple of years and then was booted out of the city and then was called back again in 1541. When he came back in 1541, he said, I'll come back, but on two conditions. Number one, all the children of the city must be catechized in the Reformed faith. And number two, the church shall exercise her own spiritual discipline. The civil magistrates agreed to that and adopted a church order that Calvin had written to that end. But even then, it took another 14 years, 1555, to utterly have the exclusive right of the church to conduct all discipline, including excommunication. In a very dramatic moment in the life of Calvin and of Geneva, there was a man named Berthelier who was a libertine. He was an open adulterer, an unrepentant adulterer, who had been excommunicated by the consistory of Geneva and barred, therefore, from the Lord's Supper. He wanted to partake of the Lord's Supper regardless of the fact that the consistory said no. And so he went over the heads of the consistory to the small council that was the body of the civil magistrates that dealt with these issues in Geneva. And he said, I want to attend the Lord's Supper. And the small council said, you may. The consistory doesn't have the rights over this. We say, and we say, you may come to the table of the Lord if you want. Well, the Lord's Supper was held the next time and Bethelier came and Calvin refused to give the Lord's Supper to him and to the Libertines. And in a very dramatic moment, he threw his hands around the sacrament and therefore around the church's right to exercise her own discipline. And he said, these hands you may crush and these arms you may lop off. My life you may take, my blood is yours, you may shed it, but you shall never force me to give holy things to the profane. The failure and the libertines backed away, and Calvin and the Church of Geneva eventually received the exclusive rights to discipline over God's people. Why was Calvin so adamant about this? Well, because Scripture is so adamant about this. The keys of the kingdom, Calvin pointed out, are given to the church in Matthew 18, verse 18, and not the state. And Calvin wrote in the Institutes, quote, Discipline depends upon the power 
of the keys. If this discipline was carried out faithfully, God was binding sins to people or loosing sins from people, and that is the prerogative of the state of the church and not the state to be used of God in that way. But that doesn't mean that Calvin did not honor the place of the state. According to Romans chapter 13, he did. He did not neglect the calling of the state to exercise her physical punishment upon evildoers for crimes. There was a very close relationship between the consistory and the small council in Geneva. And normally, if a matter came that was a sin against God and also was against the law of Geneva, the consistory would deal with that matter first from a spiritual point of view, and then they would pass it on to the small council, sometimes even giving recommendations to the small council. There were certain instances where that process was reversed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Matters came to the consistory three ways either by people going the way of Matthew 18 for private sins, which the members of Geneva did fairly regularly, or through public sins that came to the consistory's attention, or in the rarest of occasions when sins were of such an extreme nature that though they were private, they were taken directly to the consistory without going the way of Matthew 18. Most offenders who came to appear before the consistory, called by the consistory, came willingly. Some of them had to be forced, but most came willingly. And we read that often when they would come into the consistory room, they would immediately fall down on their knees, start weeping and begging for forgiveness from God and from the consistory. And yet, there were some who would fake ignorance no idea what you're talking about. And there were plenty who would outright lie to the consistory. And some who would even get angry and scream and yell at the consistory. In cases where more than one person was involved, maybe cases of issues between two people, the consistory allowed both to speak, heard the stories of both, but the consistory was very adept at figuring out who was lying and who was not. They questioned people very intensely. They questioned people often under oath. And they questioned people more than once to see if their testimony contradicted itself. In fact, the consistory's questioning of people became quite famous. They would even go and find other witnesses and bring those witnesses in to see if they corroborated or contradicted the testimony of others. Most of the time, they were able to get the matter in hand and understand who was guilty, what they were guilty of. There were some times when they couldn't. And when they concluded that they must, quote, leave the person to the judgment of God, that's a quotation from the minutes, Leave the person to the judgment of God. But that was very few and far between. The vast majority of time, they knew who was guilty and what they were guilty of. When they had determined that guilt, the consistory had three forms of spiritual correction at its disposal, as we do too. The first was admonition. If the sin was of a private character, and the person was repentant, genuinely repentant upon the admonition. This was the only correction that was given, at least if the sin was not a gross sin. That was another matter. This admonition was not just a few lines. This was something like a, a short sermon. They called it holy reproofs. Generally, Calvin was the one who gave the admonition, but the other pastors did too at times, and even some of the elders at times. They would reprove and bring to the law 
and to the gospel and back to the law again. If the issue was an offense between two, a quarrel or something like that, and the consistory could lead to repentance, then they would also conduct a, a kind of service of reconciliation right there in the consistory room where they would have repentance expressed to the other person, where there would be forgiveness expressed in front of them to the other person, and where they would say, and now you must promise this person that you will live as Christ calls you to live with them. That was admonitions or reproofs. And if it was not a gross sin, that was the only thing, if there was repentance. If there was not repentance, regardless of what the sin was, or if the sin was of a more serious character, then the consistory would immediately bar the person from the Lord's Supper for a period of at least three months and often six months and wouldn't even entertain the finding out if the person was genuinely repentant until the end of that period and working with that person. Sometimes even after six months, they'd continue another three months. And then finally, there was excommunication for stubborn unrepentance. And at times, for horrible sins that were repeated, gross sins that were repeated, sometimes the consistory would immediately say, you are excommunicated from the church. Always with the possibility down the road of repentance and restoration, of course, which for them too was the first goal, not the only goal, but the first goal of church discipline. In 1546, Five years then, after Calvin came back to Geneva the second time in 1541, the consistory had 309 discipline cases to deal with. In 1552, six years later, they had 390 cases to deal with. In 1557, two years after gaining all rights of all church discipline for the church, They had 566 cases that appeared before them. Over a period of 37 years in the life of the Church of Geneva, so take a slice of 37 years, including the time of Calvin there, the consistory suspended 7,190 people from the table of the Lord. Remember, it's a city of 10,000 growing to 20,000. Over 37 years, they suspended 7,190 people for a time from the table of the Lord. A tiny fraction of those 7,190 people, about 2% of that number, were eventually excommunicated. Every year in the life of the Church of Geneva, while Calvin was there, somewhere around 6 or 7% of the population of Geneva appeared before the consistory per year to either themselves receive church discipline or to come and be a witness for the consistory to hear testimony regarding another case of church discipline that they were dealing with. The consistory heard cases regarding fornication, adultery, marriage problems, dancing, the singing of wicked songs, cursing in public, denying a portion of the Genevan confession, lying, drunkenness, gambling, failure to attend the means of grace, petty theft, failure to send children to catechism, and many other issues besides. If you had to guess, though, what you think the number one category of cases that they dealt with in Geneva would be, what would you guess? The answer is quarrels. Quarrels. Quarrels between spouses and marriage, marriage problems. 
quarrels between friends, neighbors, bosses, and employees at work. The greatest number of cases throughout the life of the Church of Geneva that came before the consistory were those kinds of cases. So that one scholar said most of the time the consistory was a glorified counseling service. They were constantly bringing people to repentance and reconciliation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next highest category that they dealt with was sexual sin, fornication and adultery. In 1557, over 60% of the 566 cases that they faced were the combination of those two categories. Over 60% were quarrels and sexual sins. Of those cases involving sexual sins, a small fraction were cases of what we would call today sexual abuse. There was one case of sexual abuse in 1546. In 1552, there were two cases. In 1557, there was one. So it was not frequent, but it was regular, and it did happen. What now can we learn from the way that the consistory in, the, in Geneva handled these kinds of cases in particular. Ten things. Number one, we can learn from the fact that the consistory reported cases of sexual abuse to the civil authorities. They did this almost immediately. In our terms, we would say that the Genevan consistory considered herself a mandatory reporter of these kinds of cases. In the Institutes, Calvin had made a distinction between private and public sins. And then he also made a distinction between sins that were also crimes and sins that were not also crimes. And Calvin said, when a private sin comes before the consistory and that sin is not also a crime against the law of the city of Geneva, then the goal is to keep that sin as private as one possibly can. But if a sin comes, a private sin, comes to the consistory of Geneva and that sin is also a crime, the sin has to be reported also to the civil authorities even if the reporting of that sin would make it no longer private but public. It didn't always make it public, but even if it would, it had to be reported. And if reporting it to the civil authorities, because it's also a crime, meant that it did become public, the fault for that was not on the consistory, but it was upon the man who committed a sin that was also a crime. And that perhaps had to be dealt with publicly. For the majority of the sins that were also crimes in Geneva, the order was that the consistory would deal with them first, as I said. And then they would send them on to the civil authorities. But strikingly, for these kinds of sins, sins of sexual abuse, the order was reversed. And they reported these kinds of sins to the civil authorities for them to deal with and then dealt with them themselves. Let me quote from Robert Kingdon, who was he's passed away now, but was the foremost scholar of the consistory minutes of Geneva. Serious sexual crimes were generally sent directly to the small council for criminal prosecution. This particular category was one that was sent to the civil government immediately. They did not treat these cases 
without the civil authorities' involvement. They understood that the safety of others was at issue here and that the person himself may need the power of the sword in his life. How did they categorize which kinds of sins were ones that they had to send to the civil authorities? We use the term sexual abuse. That's anachronistic. They did not use that term, but they did have a way of categorizing these sins. They defined what we call sexual abuse as, quote, involuntary sexual contact, contact end quote, involuntary sexual contact. Contact And yes, they had an understanding of the abuse of power of preying on those who had no power or the older preying upon the, un- the younger. There's a lesson here for us that it's not a new thing. The reporting of cases of sexual abuse to the civil authorities. And it's not an abuse of the state's power to require ministers, elders, teachers, others to be mandatory reporters of these kinds of cases. Of course, the civil government abuses its power in a thousand ways, but this is not one of them. God has given them the power of the sword in Romans 13. And though they don't even use that power of the sword or write in so many ways, they still take up this matter of these kinds of cases and punish them with physical punishments. And we must respect the power of the sword that is given to them and be thankful for it. Article 71 of our church order comes directly out of Geneva. Quote, Christian discipline is of a spiritual nature and exempts no one from civil trial or punishment by the authorities. End quote. The civil authorities need to investigate these kinds of cases carefully and thoroughly. That reporting is commended to us down through Reformed history from Geneva to today. I'm not going to repeat what Prof. Gritters wrote in his September 15 editorial in the Standard Bearer. If you haven't read that yet, it's worth your reading. If you have, it's probably worth rereading. Nonetheless, This reporting is commended to us down through Reformed history for the same two reasons. The safety of others and for the person himself who may need the power of the sword in his life. In the church order commentary that we use, Matzma and Vendelin, and they comment in Article 73 of the church order, they say this, quote, common sense, however, still tells us that in case a brother or sister has committed a very grievous and dangerous sin, that then it may be, and now notice, it may be to his own interest and to the safety of others that it be reported. Let's comment on Article 73 of the church order. Article 73 of the church order is one of the articles that calls the church to follow the way of Matthew 18. And in their comments, Vanilla and Monsma explain what that is and why that is, but then they say there is this exception that comes down to us and remains. Common sense tells us that in case a brother or sister has committed a very grievous and dangerous sin, then it may be to his own interest and to the safety of others that it be reported There may be times when judgments have to be made. Some of those are easier, some are harder. Most of them should be very clear. Some maybe not as clear. But reporting to the authorities is the Reformed tradition all the way back to Calvin's Geneva. That first. Second, we should learn from the fact that the consistory of Geneva investigated these kinds of cases quite thoroughly. Reporting the case to the civil authorities did not mean that they then washed their hands of it and did not continue to work themselves and to investigate the matter themselves. Sometimes they had to investigate the issue 
somewhat themselves to determine if this was a case that had to go to the civil authorities. Sometimes they worked with the civil authorities. Sometimes they conducted their own investigation for their spiritual purposes alongside the investigation of the civil authorities. But investigate, they did. As I said before, they used the oath. They put people under oath before God. Swear before God. Did you do this thing or did you not? They call God to punish you if you lie. They called witnesses to give testimony and often had them be under oath. Did you see this? Did you hear this? Did you not? Did you know this? Did you know that? And they weighed the evidence. They investigated the matter, especially when they believed there could be dangers to the flock. In their thorough investigating, they had the wisdom to understand that with sexual crimes, if one has been committed, often others have two. Not always, but it was a pattern, and they knew it was. And so they investigated these thoroughly. In 1552, there was a case of a married man named Hudri Rojad. He had a young maid who worked for their family who was named Mache Marar. Rojad had raped the maid who was working for their family. The consistory dealt with that issue. They sent it to the civil authorities and then continued their own investigation as they barred the man from the Lord's Supper. In their own investigation, they discovered that the Rojad family had had a maid previously who was not this same maid, a different young maid earlier in the life of the family. <clears throat> they were concerned about this, and they dug into the matter, and their hunch proved to be true. They discovered in the course of the investigation that Indeed, Rojad had raped that young maid as well. Years earlier, they investigated their cases thoroughly to be sure they didn't get in over their heads and fancy themselves forensic scientists. And sometimes they even asked the civil government to investigate the case itself thoroughly before they made a judgment. But the consistory did their work Thoroughly, They investigated thoroughly. I'm convinced that we can learn something from this. Our investigations of these kinds of sins should be more thorough and probably more invasive than we have been comfortable with in the past, including looking at people's computers with their prior consent, of course calling witnesses to come and give their accounts of the situation, using the oath in accord with Lord's Day 37 of the Heidelberg Catechism, putting people under oath, you swear before God, you call God to witness to you that he punish you if you lie. What happened in this situation? Third, It's worth us noting that in Geneva, others were urged to report these kinds of sins and crimes to the consistory of Geneva and were even ecclesiastically chastened if the consistory discovered that a person could have reported this to them and did not. The consistory called people in these kinds of cases, in these kinds of extreme, gross cases, to come to the consistory without going the way of Matthew 18. And they even put consequences upon people if they didn't. In that same case of Rojad, who had raped his two maids, the consistory in the course of their investigation also discovered that the wife 
knew about this, at least knew about the second maid when she got pregnant. And so did she want to hide this and cover this up that nobody would find out about it, that she told the young girl that she must abort the baby. And if she wouldn't, then deliver it and bring it to her. And she, the wife of Rojad, would take care of it. But she did not report it to the consistory. She hid it. The consistory, of course, put her under church discipline when they found this out. But more telling is that the consistory discovered that there was another lady who knew that this rape had occurred. And that lady did not report it to the consistory either. She did a lot of good things. She told the young maid not to listen to Rojad's wife, deliver the baby and bring the baby to the deacons, she said. The deacons will help you and know what to do and care for you in this situation. And the consistory commended her for that. But she did not report the rape to the consistory. And for that, they even put her under church discipline for a time. These kinds of cases, these kinds of sins, cannot sit known to family members or others for years so that more are hurt. Again, for two reasons, the safety of others and the person's own need of discipline and possibly even the power of the sword in their life. Fourth, the consistory questioned all parties involved, as we said, investigated very thoroughly these kinds of cases, understood the whole situation, tried to get the whole matter in hand, and they believed the one who was in the position of victim if there was no reason to doubt it. There was a case in 1557 regarding a man named Michel Pointu, French man. It came out through that throughout the course of this man's marriage, he had been pestering his wife's sister constantly, soliciting her for sexual favors. And finally, in one instance, he had wickedly fondled his wife's sister, all this entirely against his sister-in-law's will. The consistory investigated the matter, and it came out that Michelle's behavior had begun long ago, even before he and his wife were married, and that it had begun upon this future sister-in-law while the sister was a minor, even, that he was pestering her this way. When the consistory confronted Michelle about this, he tried to turn the tables on the sister-in-law. He said, it's her fault. She flirts all the time, and she's constantly pursuing me. What, what do you expect? The consistory smelled a rat. The sister said no. The wife said she'd never seen anything like this. And they believed the sister and did not believe Michelle and put him under church discipline. And it appears from what follows that this particular man was eventually excommunicated from the church and banished from the city of Geneva. They investigated thoroughly and believed the one in the position victim if there was no reason to doubt it. Fifth, while the consistory tended to believe the one who was in position of victim, if there was no reason to doubt it, they did not believe a person in the position of victim absolutely or without investigation or contrary to reason. There was a sad case. This was after Calvin's death, actually where a young chambermaid named Pernet accused a, a soldier passing through of raping her. The consistory sent the case to the civil authorities immediately, and it appears that the, they worked together to investigate the matter. 
Pernette testified that she had screamed so loudly when this was happening and afterwards that her mistress had come running to her and found her on the ground, a mess and in a pile of tears. However, that mistress testified that this did not happen. She heard no screaming. She did not run to find Pernet, and she did not find Pernet on the ground in her tears. Neighbors were questioned. They didn't hear any screaming either. I'll spare you all the details of the lengthy report, but the consistory discovered that it was not possible that the woman had been raped by the soldier. However, they did discover that the young woman had been raped by a soldier a year earlier. And it became clear that the one who had raped her a year earlier was a Calvary man, just like this soldier a year later was a Calvary man. And they came to the conclusion that the woman was not raped the second time, but that the trauma of the previous rape had led to a reliving of the experience when this second Calvary man came into the house. And though they didn't have language to describe that, they understood something like this was possible. I want to be very, very careful in reporting that case to you. I don't want people to use that wrongly to doubt the testimony of a victim. But the point is, they investigated thoroughly. They were careful. They were wise. They were thorough. They understood there's lives at stake here. Six. The consistory dealt with what the Lord placed upon them without fear or favor. People from all classes of life in Geneva appeared before the consistory for discipline. Laborers, construction workers, but then also lawyers and bankers and politicians and yes, even consistory members of the consistory of the Church of Geneva. Though I don't think there is any case of sexual abuse among the consistory members of the Church of Geneva. I haven't been able to find that, if there is. They were disciplined for other things. Consistory members were without fear or favor. Though the civil government in Geneva had a statute of limitations, the consistory did not have a statute of limitations, and they dealt with sins from long ago, if need be. In one instance, a church member who was also a politician of the highest rank in Geneva was suspended from the Lord's Supper for a time for an instance of adultery that had occurred 12 years ago and that had just come out. Without fear or favor, they served Christ and his church. There can perhaps be the temptation sometimes to look the other way if something happened many years ago. The consistory in Geneva did not. Seventh, and this one's the hardest for me to talk about, and is the hardest for you to even hear about and think about. The church members of the city of Geneva understood the pain and the terrible, terrible tension between wanting to hold someone that they love back from testifying in a case like this that had been perpetrated against them, especially children, minors, and yet wanting them to testify to stop the possibility of this pain happening to somebody else. There's a stomach-churning case 
1577, again after Calvin's death, where a man sexually abused a seven-year-old girl on five different occasions. In the course of the investigation, it came out that there were a string of these that this man had engaged in before this one with the seven-year-old girl, and that they involved both young boys and young girls. It also came out in the investigation that the parents of the young boys and the young girls, many of them at least, were aware of what had happened to their young children, what this man had done to them. Some had responded by screaming and yelling at that man. Others had responded by beating him half to death. But they all sent him down the road. And when questioned about it, they said the reason, or they didn't tell anybody, was because they didn't want to put their child through the pain of having to relive that experience and testify of it to the consistory, which you can understand, and I can understand, and it's heartbreaking. It was the parents of the seven-year-old daughter who were finally the ones to put a stop to it, though it was terribly painful for young Marie Besson, that was her name, the seven-year-old girl, to do what she did and to testify of this to the consistory. And how many could have been spared if a report or testimony had come earlier? This hurts. And how many know this tension? Sadly, heartbreakingly, And you don't want to push. There has to be some urging, or they have to be willing, and you can't force it. But if it's possible, painful though it is, testify, testify for the safety of others and for the potential good of the person who was caught in such a sin. If it's at all possible, a testimony must be given. Eighth, the consistory did not quickly restore people to the fellowship of the church who were guilty of these kinds of sins. In fact, they didn't restore quickly to the fellowship of the church people who were guilty of other kinds of sexual sins, either fornication or adultery. As I said, they would bar from the Lord's Supper immediately and have a period of probation, wouldn't even consider repentance until sometime down the road when a person could show over a period of time genuine repentance and could be worked with and could show that genuine repentance. Often, in the most serious cases, the person, when the matter went to the civil authorities, in these terrible, terrible cases, often the person was executed by the civil authorities, but not in every case. Some were eventually excommunicated, banished from the city. Some, few, or even restored after careful work and observing the work of the Spirit in the person. Ninth, the perpetrator of sexual abuse, if he was not executed by the civil authorities, was made to pay for damages incurred as much as was reasonably possible. For example, in the case of a married man who raped a girl, the result of which rape was a pregnancy, the man was made to pay for the birth of that child and for the expenses to raise that child as well. Tenth, and finally, Calvin was adamant 
Let church discipline be the application, this is his words now, of both oil and vinegar. And the consistory took that seriously. Oil and vinegar. Vinegar bites, it's justice. Oil is mercy applied for healing. Oil and vinegar. The vinegar of justice may sometimes include a certain amount of righteous anger. Carefully, righteously. But it may not include vengeance. Churchly or personal vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In handling these matters, one must not confuse the vinegar of justice with vengeance. The goal is still to be able to show mercy, to bring to mercy a truly repentant person brought before the foot of the cross to receive mercy in Jesus Christ. But we must also, on the other hand, not think that the oil of mercy means a weakening of the vinegar of justice. Mercy is not the lessening of the vinegar of justice for Calvin or the consistory of Geneva. Justice to deal with things truthfully, honestly, and to give them their due, that the guilty might be driven by the bite of that vinegar to find the oil of mercy in Jesus Christ and to put the sin away, and if not, to be removed from the church altogether. Oil and vinegar. At the time of Calvin's Geneva, <clears throat> the church was coming out of a period of sexual looseness and deviancy in the culture. Before Calvin was in Geneva, <clears throat> for example, prostitution was legal in the city of Geneva. Calvin understood that church discipline along with the proclamation of the word, would be what God would use to keep the church from being overrun by the evil of the age. In his words, that discipline was the sinews that held the church together and did not let it fall apart under the crashing waves of the godlessness of the age. The faithful church of Christ today has been going headlong into a period of sexual looseness, a looseness the likes of which we have not seen before. Church discipline, faithful, tireless, biblical, wise, convicted church discipline will be a key that God uses to preserve his church in such an age. It no less than the faithful proclamation of the word of God must be a mark of the church that shines brightly. Keep the church upon the foundation of God's word and to keep her from being washed away to by the godlessness of the age. Brother pastors and brother elders, it's a tremendous amount of work. It is work. You are on the front lines in these things, and most people don't have any idea how many hours upon hours you use laboring in the kingdom of Jesus Christ in this work. But the king of the church does. He sees and he knows. Give yourself for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and for him. May this lecture encourage you to be faithful in your work, to do what is right, to be wise, to be careful. Don't fear men's faces. Do what it takes. Don't give up. Rule well and be counted worthy of a double honor. Perhaps if the Lord tarries 400 years from now, your consistory minutes will be uncovered. If they are, may it be for the encouragement of the church and faithful church discipline in the future. 
if they are never discovered. And may those minutes still give witness to your faithfulness in your work as you serve the church, God's precious sheep, and the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. Deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with the good. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Grease. Very evident. Lots of time was spent on that lecture. Very informative for us. I'd like to also thank Brian for playing the organist for us. And uh, I do have a few announcements. We will have refreshments in the back, so feel free to, to stay around and, and talk. We do have a couple other offers. Um, I should say offers. But the Standard Bearer did a magazine regarding sexual abuse, which most of you know. If you don't, there's several copies in the back. You're welcome to take however many you'd like. Also, uh, there's the book or large pamphlet on spousal abuse in the back. Likewise with that, take what you would like. Again, on the table back there. And there's a compiled list. This list really just came from that Standard Bearer. Um, but it's just in paper form, so it's very easy to look at several other uh, reference books and so forth that were recommended regarding abuse, and I would encourage you to, to take that as well. This lecture was posted on the Facebook site for Southwest, and so you should be able to find that later as well, um, and also sermon audio. Um, at this point, I guess, let's sing Psalter 242. Psalter 242, all the stanzas.
At this point, I'm going to ask Prof. Grease to close in prayer. Shall we pray together? Our Father and King in heaven, we look to Thee and beseech Thee for wisdom and understanding hearts. And grant that to us, O God, from Thy Word, from a multitude of counselors, and give us the courage to go forward in faithfulness to Thee and to the Holy Scriptures. We stood before sobering thoughts this evening. We live in a world that is fallen and in a world where human beings are totally depraved and even regenerated ones have that depraved old man within them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that Thou wilt work by Thy Holy Spirit that we might be faithful in our respective callings and situations. Keep us, O God, from the wickedness of the age in which we live. Preserve thy church and preserve thy people, we pray. Cause that thy church be steadfast and strong and a light in a world of darkness. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who have been hurt by this sin perpetrated against them that thou wilt uphold them as only thou canst that thou would show thyself a faithful friend who sticks closer than a brother to them and who understands all of their pain art thou not the God who holds all of our tears in a bottle are they not all written in thy book and father may we know that thou art working all things unto the glorious end of our life with thee in perfection. Pray for those, O God, who are of consistories and who must deal with these kinds of matters that come to them. Give them wisdom. Give them endurance in this work. Give them understanding hearts. Give them unity of mind and soul and of purpose for the glory of thy name and for the good of thy church. And we pray too, O God, for those who have given themselves over to a sin such as this, that thou wilt break the bondage and the hold that it has upon them. And if it be thy will, restore them utterly broken at the foot of the cross to the life of Christ in his church. And if not, Lord, then give the consistory the wisdom to put them out knowing that there can still be repentance and return worked by thee. But for the preservation of the church and the glory of thy name. And so, O God, uphold all of us in such a day as this. Send us with thy blessing and with strength from thy Holy Spirit. In our Savior's name we pray.